legs again. Better than going to a chiropractor, right? <laughs> All right, love lifted me. One, seven, three. I was sinking deep in sin, far from the peaceful shore. chapter 2, this, this new entity being empowered by the Spirit of God called the church caused quite a stir in Jerusalem and the, the apostles were they were accused of being drunk <coughs> they heard them speaking in all kinds of foreign languages and they didn't know they were foreign languages probably uh, because they, they said that they were drunk at now, you would think in Jerusalem, which was a large commerce place, and hearing people from all over the world, they would have known that they were known languages, but you know, they just didn't seem to get it. And so they accused them of being inebriated in the middle of the day, and of course, Peter, now Peter becomes the main focus of the apostles, and he says, these men are not drunk as you would think they are. He says, but they're speaking every, every language that's here today. And he names what the languages are, so we, we see that these are actually known foreign languages within the, the uh, city of Jerusalem and they're speaking through this power of the Holy Spirit of God uh, these known languages but yet seemingly unknown to those who inhabited Jerusalem at the time. And then chapter 2 rolls around 
as the, the day of Pentecost and uh, it, it's talking about they're preaching these things and Jesus of course in, in, John, in Acts chapter 1 speaking to the uh, disciples and the apostles to go tarry at Jerusalem until they're imbued with power and then chapter 2 is the fulfillment of that and they're preaching a, a particular message about the resurrection of the dead the resurrection of Jesus Christ and how he has been chosen by God to be the Lord and King and uh, John chapter 3 comes around and they're being accused, they're being arrested, which often happens in our world today when someone decides they're going to take a stand for Jesus Christ in public and they go out in the highways and the hedges compelling people to be saved, to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And in so doing, uh, they're often attacked and maligned and uh, maltreated. And oftentimes they're arrested, not so much here in the States, but maybe that won't take very long before that becomes something that uh, is deemed unconstitutional. Uh, and the free speechers uh, who, de who deny free speech seem to be working very, very hard at things they call disinformation. And so we, we see these things culminating and probably a, a time when we want to silence anybody who wants to say anything that's true. And uh, so, so uh, this, this chapter 2 uh, goes on and speaks about these things. And, and I want to draw your attention to verse 41 of chapter 2. Now go to verse 37. Verse 37 of, John, of Acts chapter 2 says, now, now at this time when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. And said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? And then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. That's the day we're living in today. There's much of an untoward generation. They're untoward God. You are toward God. You repented toward God. You, you repented and you have faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. And the multitude of the world today, they're untoward. They're, they're opposite. They're opposing God's will uh, that they not perish. And God is willing to let them perish if they don't uh, do what God requires of them, and that's to believe the gospel and to glorify the Lord in so doing. It says, uh, verse 41, uh, says, Then they that gladly received his word. You see, it's always in order with God. There's nothing out of order with God at all. It's hearing the word of God, believing the word of God, and then following through with the word of God. And we, we, you know, when people come in and say, well, I was baptized as a baby. Sorry, your baptism meant nothing except for the people who had you baptized. Maybe it made your mom and your dad feel good about themselves, but it did you absolutely nothing because you didn't believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you don't go backward and say, well, I was baptized, and so I'll just put the Buddhist after I got saved. No, you get saved, you get baptized scripturally, and it's a whole different thing than what many, many people who attend various organizations called churches, uh, but they deny the word of God and the power of God, and that's, that's their functionality. They just, just say, we're gonna, yeah, we believe the Bible, but we do things our way. Well, that's, that's not really obeying the Bible. And obeying the Bible is, is, is better than just hearing the word and ignoring the word. And that's the problem a lot of churches are. Uh, I was talking to Brother Frank earlier, and the former pastor of uh, First Bible Baptist Church, um, Plainville. Many of you, I think, maybe have attended there for some fellowship in the past. I'm uncertain about that. But these, uh, th th this brother, he decided it was time for him to step out of the ministry, and he had a fellow under his uh, care that he was leading and hoping that he'd be able to take the uh, First Bible Baptist into the next level. And it turned out that this guy was a wolf in sheep's clothing, and it is no longer a Baptist church, it's a charismatic church, and they change everything inside, and they, their whole, everything is different, everything is different. And they had to sell uh, the property, they had to change, they had to dissolve First Bible Baptist Church because of all 
to save the brethren and left. That's Plainville? They left like Plainville. Plainville yeah. wow. I heard this from Brother Benson himself wow. just the other day. I, I was totally surprised, totally taken aback by it. But here's a man who for what, 40 years just minister for God to build a great work out there. And uh, he turns it over to this wolf and sheep's clothing. And it's, it's a mess. It, according to you and I, it would be a mess. To, to the world, it would be, to the charismatics, it would be yeah. something. This is great, you know? You don't have to, you know, none of this hard preaching or anything like that. I mean, just do what's right in your own eyes. But it was a sad thing. And, and, and I'm concerned about Bethel Baptist Church here. Uh, when my time comes to step down, and there's no one really here to take my place that I that has said, you know, I'm interested in getting into the ministry. And uh, I, I was just wondering if I could, you know, maybe just hang around with you and see what you do and whatnot and how things function this way. But none of that, you know, some hopeful people have come through. We were thinking, well, maybe this is someone who uh, might be uh, able to take over the work. I just wouldn't want to have to see a change from a Bible-believing church to uh, anything goes down the church. And it is, it is a completely different thing. Uh, the whole thing you would never know. It's, it's called Rock Point now, I think. It's Rock Point. Uh, I don't even think they call them, they don't even call themselves Baptist Rock Point Church, which is typical of modern churches today because they neglect this Bible. So when Brother Frank is teaching about the preservation of the perfect King James Bible, it's a serious matter. I know probably some of you really don't care much about that. But that's not just the official stance here. This is this is what we absolutely would like to see everyone on board with. Uh, because if, if you're chosen to decide who's going to be next in the pulpit up here, uh, if you have any interest in the King James Bible being upheld here, you, you need to uh, really vet the next person very, very well. And that goes for me. I mean, if I see somebody come in, somebody comes up to me and says, okay, what we're going to say. You don't have any problem with me. You don't have any problem with Brother Frank. You don't have any problem with Brother Ernie because we, we know where we stand. Brother Jim, same way. Brother Jim Barragall, same way. So when we open up the Word of God, we believe it's God's Word. We believe it's perfect, even though we might not understand everything about it. Everything about it. <laughs> Did say, say anything about it? <laughs> everything about it. Okay, so that's the reason why we are a church. That's the reason why we're here this morning. There used to be hardly a place you could sit in here, at least every pew had somebody sitting in it, and I don't mean just because of today, but in, in years past. Some things took place, and other people were drawn away, some people passed away, and it, it just changed over time. But still, even uh, with uh, the size that we're at, uh, I would hate to see this go into the hands of someone who really doesn't care about what kind of Bible they use or what they even have to say. You can check whatever we preach about up here, whatever we teach about. You can check it out in your own Bible. You might still not agree with it, but it's just simply this is put forth as we're, we're standing on the King James Bible as God's preserved word, and there's no argument. As far as, yeah. Not as far as we're concerned. Okay. All right, so, this, so now uh, here uh, in, in Acts chapter number 2, uh, it says, after they gladly received his word, they were baptized. You see, you see the order there? Believe the word, then baptize. Mm -hmm. All right? So that's the thing. It doesn't say believe the word and never sin again and be baptized. It, it says believe the word and then be baptized. There's a lot of baptized believers who followed that prescription and they got lost out in the world again. I don't mean they lost their salvation. I just did. They lost themselves from a, a, a church that was trying to preach and teach the word of God and they got caught up in the world all over again. That was like the prodigal son. He had everything he ever could want and he went off and he ended up in a hog pen of life. <laughs> and this is what happens to a lot of believers. They're still saved, they're still believers, but boy, they need a good old washing. They need a good old cleansing. And only the blood of Jesus Christ can cleanse a person who's been like that and change their attitude, change their direction back in their the good and the right way that God has provided for us, okay? So when you see someone who's been out in the world, it used to be maybe a, 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 a faithful attendee here at Bethel Baptist Church, be gracious to them, because that could be you. By the grace of God, you are here. Amen. And, and by nothing else. Mm -hmm. And uh, if you think differently, then you're wrong. 
I'm glad you chose to be here today. All right, I'm glad you choose to be here anytime we're here. Okay, so, so. Uh, they were baptized, and the same day they were added to them about 3,000 souls. So here's, here's a huge uh, uh, change happening in Jerusalem. Many, many souls getting saved. And they continued. This is what they did afterward. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with, sing with gladness and singleness of heart. That they had the same mind. There was a unity here. Now when you got saved, I don't think the first thought that came in your mind was that, oh, you know, I bet you that. That person over there is not saved. I bet you that person, no, you know, your thought was, thank God there's a, there's a cleansing for my sin. Thank God he was willing to save my soul. Thank God I'm on my way to heaven now. Thank God that uh, I, I've got this new life and I'm excited and I'm just so happy to be here. You thought everybody who went to church was saved when you got saved. And then after a while, you, you said, you know, what happened to so-and-so? I don't see them around anymore. And sadly, someone has to inform you that, well, you know, they, uh, they just, uh, you know, seem to be taking a break. They're falling by the wayside, whatever like that. Still saved, you know, it, it was a true profession of faith. But be gracious to those people and just try to draw them back in. God hasn't given up on them. They're saved individuals washed in the blood of Jesus Christ. If their salvation was genuine, if their conversion was genuine to that. Okay? All right, so that's what they did. Now, now okay, now over in 1 John chapter number 1. So we're going from Acts chapter 2. Long ways to uh, 1 John. You know, the years have gone by. And the churches been uh, popping up all over the area over there and the apostles writing their epistles, their letters and in 1 John written by the apostle John it begins this way, that which was from the beginning which we have heard which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled of the word of life now see the capital W there in your Bible, what, what did Brother Frank teach you that meant? Christ that's Jesus Christ. What well, is it when it's a, a lowercase w? What did Brother Frank teach you now? You don't want me to have him come back up here and do the lesson. It's the Bible. It's the written word of God, the small w. These are important differences. Capital W, in the beginning was the word. Right? That's Jesus Christ. Before he was manifest in the flesh. All right, so the little W is the Bible, and the capital W is the title of Jesus Christ, the Word of Life. For the life was manifested, and we, I'm sorry I had to bring Brother Frank up. <laughs> but, you know, he, he's a good whipping post, you know what I mean? For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and shew unto you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested unto us. It was revealed to us. That life was revealed to you one day when someone opened up the word, the Bible, and showed you things from it that you never heard before, never knew before, and you believed it. And you called upon the Lord to save your soul, and he did just that for you. That's right. And goes on. It was revealed to you. That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And these things write me unto you that your joy may be full. This then is the message which we have heard of Him and declare unto you that God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with Him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light, what's the light? It's the Word of God. As he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. 
if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. All right, so go back to verse number nine. If we confess our sins, that's to God, you confess it to God, uh, he is faithful and he is the faithful witness. Jesus Christ, every time we fall off the wagon, as it were, every time we go by the wayside, every time we walk in another's field and not the Lord's field, every time we stray off from the green pastures and the still waters into the wild life of this world, we can always come back home. We can always come back to God because he's not willing that any should perish. And if your faith truly is upon Jesus Christ, and his death, burial, and resurrection, you are sealed forever, and God is doing the keeping power. Amen. He does not want you wandering off into the wilderness of sin. He does not want you disregarding his word. He does not want me disobeying the word of God. And he would rather that we walk as children of light, bearing the armor of light on a daily basis, and enjoy it. Amen. And that's the difference. But a lot of God's kids, they don't, just like Israel. You can always, just look at the history of Israel if you want to see how it is to live as a Christian. You know, we don't have to live that way. Israel did not have to live that way. But what got Israel messed up is they kept looking at the neighbors. Those surrounding nations, they kept looking over, oh, look what they got over there. You know, why can't we do that? Well, God says in his word, that we, yeah, but look at it. It's it's good for the eyes. It's, it, you know, what, what a thing it is. And, and, and it's joyful, it's just like Adam and Eve, you know? And, and this, is, this was Israel's downfall. It's your downfall. It's my downfall. That's the path that does not lead to eternal destruction because you've already been removed from that path. But you like to go back. I like to go back and, and walk on those old pathways a little bit there. It's just a little nostalgia. So when they have, well, you know, we look at those things, we should not be looking back except as a reminder and say, I remember what brought me to Jesus Christ. I remember what caused me to repent of my sin and trust Jesus Christ as my Savior. That's what looking back is for. We can look back on the years of Bethel Baptist Church's existence and we say, we saw where that mistake brought us. We saw where that person's sin really got us messed up. I see what happened to me when, uh, I, when, that, when I chose to do that particular thing. Boy, I was out of fellowship for God for, for months, months, and months. And, you know, we look back at those things simply to remind us that we're to be pressing forward unto Jesus, who is the author and finisher of our faith. What I want to point out to you is this biblical idea, this biblical principle of fellowship. Now, we're, we're having a, a dinner back there, you know, luncheon back there. And it's just a time where we can, you know, just chill out, we relax, enjoy a meal with each other. And it's a, it seems to be a tradition among Baptists to be able to enjoy a meal once in a while with each other. And just, just chat and find out maybe some things, uh, uh, catch up on some things that we uh, were, you know, without really digging into each other's lives. Uh, but what is fellowship, anyway? Is it a dinner? No, it's not a dinner. Um, Fellowship is, according to Webster, a state of being together, a partnership of joint interest. It's a companionship with others, mutual association as equal and friendly, on equal and friendly terms. So the thing that binds us together, the thing that brought us together is Jesus Christ. And it could have been through a friend initially, but then, okay, now, now I understand well, who's really the one that I should be here for? And that's, that's the risen Savior. And understanding, okay, uh, whenever that guy stands up there on the pulpit and he opens up the Bible and he talks to me, he's, he's not just giving me stuff that, you know, interests him. He's giving me counsel from God. And certainly, you know, I, I, I certainly have, can't measure up to anything uh, other than yourselves, and realize that my responsibility up here, these men's responsibility here, will handle the word of God. 
that we don't do this deceitfully or twist the scriptures up to our own destruction or yours. All right, so in, in Acts chapter 2, uh, this, is, this is how it went. They continued together in one accord. They preached and taught the gospel, exhorting other people to believe it. They fulfilled the ordinances of baptism and the Lord's Supper together. They had fellowship together. And it was more than just getting together for church because they broke bread with each other. And that wasn't the Lord's Supper because that was just a, that was a part of their gathering. But the breaking of bread from house to house was not a reenactment of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. It was a, let's sit down and have a meal together. Let's, let's get together for a cup of coffee and a thorn you know, and, and talk about the Lord. And see, you know, are there some needs that you have that I might be able to help you with? Is uh, people just inquiring about each other, showing a, a love because the love of God is shed abroad in our hearts, a love that we never really experienced before, uh, before we came to know Jesus as our Savior. Fellowship is an important function for the body of Christ. It's one of the key words in 1 John chapter number 1, which we just read. Now, there's one overall truth that 1 John brings out, and that self is that salvation should bring men into a close relationship with God and with other Christians. That's the overlaying truth about this, this chapter. Fellowship with all of one's brothers and sisters on Christ and on a biblical foundation. Now, if I have friends up at St. Anthony's, if I have relatives who go up to St. Anthony's, or, you know, if, if I know somebody that goes over to the Lutheran church, something like that, I, I can't fellowship with them on the basis of biblical uh, fellowship because we don't believe the same thing. We may believe the same words that, well, we, we understand what Jesus means. We, we understand who Jesus is. We understand... Uh, uh, who Mary is, but we think different things about Mary, and uh, we think different things about uh, the Bible. And so with those things, we cannot functionally get together. We have to be very, very polite, and we could not bring anything up about the Scriptures, otherwise it's not going to be a friendly encounter. Right. But I could sit with you, and you could sit with me, and we could get a, 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 a like-minded church in another town, in another state, from the other side of the world, come together and we have something mutual that we can talk about and enjoy talking about. And it won't be fishing, but it could be some fishing in there. It might not be anything about, you know, uh, hobbies that we might have. It's centered around Jesus Christ. It's centered around the Holy Word of God. Amen. And that's what brings our fellowship to a, a higher level of importance than just getting together for getting together's sake. We don't want that to really happen. Uh, so you spend time with your friends, and, and what what comes of that? Do you, do they know you're a believer? Do you know that one day when you stand before God, they're going to stand before God, and you'll be at the white you'll be at the judgment seat of Christ? They they're probably going to end up with a white throne judgment. Everybody, it's appointed of the man wants to die, but after this, the judgment. So the overall purpose for getting together cannot be love. It cannot be love because love covers a multitude of sins and it sends a lot of people to hell. Love is, is of God because God is love. But love is founded upon the word of truth. And if we don't have this word of truth, your love is just a worldly carnal type of a love, even though in your head you're thinking, I'm doing God's bidding. Yeah. And so we can sit down with people and try to convince them that the Bible's true. We, you go to Dunkin' Donuts, and sometimes I've been to Dunkin' Donuts with Brother Frank, and uh, somebody will be sitting down close by at a table, and I'll look over to them and just start talking to them. Hey, do you live around here? You know, you go to church anywhere around here? It just segues into an opening where I can give them a gospel track. I said, yeah, if you're in the area, stop by someday. I'd like to have you come in and visit with us sometime. Well, thanks. You usually, you know, being polite. They may never darken our doorstep, but it doesn't really matter. They have to make a choice. 
And, and if your friendship is just on carnal pleasure, carnal enjoyment, and just uh, kicking back, and just because they're nice people, you're a nice person, what are they doing with Jesus? So they know they need to make a choice anywhere along the way. So our fellowship has to be based on the Word of God, the Word of truth. And uh, attendance and participation in a local church such as ours can be an indicator of someone's fellowship with the Lord. Now, I understand that a lot of people uh, had other plans. This was kind of like, the, I think, the first or second week in September that I chose the end of the, uh, today to be the day for the fellowship. So there wasn't like a couple of months ahead of time. People had plans, and I understand that. But there's other people who are incapacitated. They just can't get out. And just, you know, and for them to get out is such a struggle and a, and a hardship. And many of you go through the same thing. And you made it here, and I, and I thank God for that. And it's a blessing for my heart to see you here. But there are those people because maybe they have to work. Maybe that's, you know, their life is structured in such a way that they can't get out of not working on a Sunday morning or a, a time, another time during the course of the week where, where they just can't make themselves available because it's so important that they get those hours in. But typically we have to understand what God spoke to us about in Hebrews chapter number 10. In Hebrews chapter number 10, uh, the Lord gives us uh, an exhortation, as you, if you please, to call it that. In verse number uh, 23, it says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith. Okay? So you have made a profession of faith. You profess, you proclaim, you say that in your heart you have trusted Jesus Christ. Christ is your Savior, you will tell your relatives that, you will tell your immediate family about that, you will tell your friends about that, you will tell co-workers as many as you have uh, availability to do. You want people to know that's the way it goes. And not just because they've asked you and they think you're a little strange in your lifestyle and where you go and what you do, uh, but it's something that uh, your life reveals something. You've become a different person since trusting Jesus Christ as your Savior. And people have noticed. Amen. That's the difference. Yeah. So he says, hold fast to that profession. Don't let that slip away. Don't let that be forgotten by you. You hold fast to that, your profession of faith. Because as Brother Frank has often pointed out, he says there's a difference between believing something and knowing it. You should walk around knowing that you're saved, you're on your way to glory, and everybody you come in contact with may not be going there. Friend or foe. Right. These are things we have to understand. Hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, flip-flopping. Okay, I'm this way in front of you guys, but when I get with my pals, I'm a whole different creature. It's not... It's not that's, that's unacceptable to God. Uh, every first of the month, uh, there's a get-together with the guys that I go to the gym with. And some are older than me, some are younger than me. And these guys enjoy drinking. And so they bring, they go to a place where they can bring their own booze. And they're always offering it to me, and I always deny it, and always put it down. They mock me a little bit about being, you know, a preacher or stuff like that. Then they'll ask me some questions about, you know, what is it you believe, and what is this? So I get an opportunity to talk to them. I enjoy the food uh, as well, but uh, it's just something that happens. And I, ha I, I can't let that profession go <coughs> because I am to be an emblem of forgiveness, an emblem of uh, God's grace and mercy in this world. And what's the reason why you don't drink? Now, there's a, a fellow there who's pretty Jewish, and he won't eat anything with pork in it. But he'll guzzle that wine down until he, you know, he, his eyes turn uh, you know, color. But, uh, and, and I, you know, I haven't really had an opportunity to sit down and talk with him, but I'm getting to know him a little bit better. Hopefully that time will come. So, okay, so he goes on. Hold the profession of your faith without wavering, for he is faithful to promise. Brother Frank was talking about the promises this morning. Let us consider one another. 
I'm, I'm considering you this morning. And you're, and you're saying, you know, you're considering me. You have the opportunity to do that, to provoke you unto love and to good works. I'm, I'm prodding you. I'm provoking you. I, I want you to, you know, it's like, it's like the guy with the, you know, the sheep and with the shepherd's rod, the shepherd's staff, or the one who's leading the oxen, and he's got a little cat and nine tail, just kind of like tapping the, uh, them or talking to the animals, get them to move. And... And God does that to me because he's the, he's the good shepherd. You know, sometimes a, an under shepherd can get out of hand and say things that he shouldn't be saying. I'm talking about people in this position right here. And I probably have done that in the past. So he says, provoking you to love and the good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. What day is that? That's the day of the Lord. You see? So that combines assembling together with holding fast a profession of faith. All right? So, so when we say, okay, we're going we're gonna to go down the green and we're going we're gonna to preach the word of God. And so it's, it's like everybody's invited and maybe three, four people show up. All right? So the reason could be very, very important that you didn't go. It's understandable. You can't get everybody to do the same thing at the same time. And, and, and then when we say, okay, we're going to have a fellowship, and we, we, we prepare for that, and, and then people just, you know, things come up and they can't, they can't show up. I mean, it's understandable. It has to be understandable because, you know, there's going to be a day when maybe I can't show up here. I'm going to have to uh, ask Brother Frank and Brother, Brother Ernie uh, or maybe my wife to preach to you and then go from there. <laughs> Somebody's listening. <laughs> so what is John saying? He, he's saying that you and I can be in fellowship with each other if we are in fellowship with the Father and the Son. Because our fellowship is with the Father and the Son. How can you sit down with a Muslim other than to be kind to them and then you start talking about, if you don't start talking about Jesus Christ, how could you say that they're your friend or you care about them? They need to know that Jesus Christ is who he says he is and he's going to do the things that he says he's going to do. Right. And they're not going to be in a good place when that happens because they're taught that God can't have a son. Well, then they can't have a resurrection either, a good one. Because that's why Jesus came. But our fellowship, according to John, here in 1 John, which we knew from other portions of scriptures, is our fellowship is with the Father and the Son. So this epistle is written to help set that relationship right and to keep that fellowship strong. And that's what we need to do here at Bethlehem Baptist Church. Keep these things going, keep them strong. Uh, the person who's absolutely uh, in love with God and what he's done for them will also love their brethren as well. And the believer who does not abide in the fellowship with God, outside of his relationship to Jesus Christ, uh, you know, makes a profession of faith in Christ, but he's not really a good, close fellowship with God. He'll find human relationships difficult to maintain. It's just the way God has designed it all. It's the way he's designed us. Yeah, we were dead in trespasses and sins. We're no longer dead in trespasses and sins. We could have gotten along with anybody who was dead in trespasses and sins because they were just as dead in trespasses and sins as we were. And though we might have been religious, might have been brought up in a church, but until you're born again, those things, they just seem like normal stuff. That's how it ought to be. So yeah, you could sit down with, with the priest uh, and have a bottle of wine. And you could, you could enjoy a couple shots with the boys from the bowling uh, game. And, and you could do that because, you know, but when you get saved and you learn these truths from the word of God, how God wants us to walk in this world, how we're to walk before God and man. It's not just walking before God, brother. It's walking before men. When I lose my temper at my computer or at the shop, I, 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 I tell you, I, I can say some things. And I need to learn that there's people in there that are lost. And if, if they see the, this guy who says he's the preacher you know, uh, getting angry, and I, I, it's not right. It's just not right. 
So I have to be uh, on the watch all the time. I can't just let them accept that because it's not acceptable in the eyes of God. So God designed the family. He designed it to be a man, a woman, and an offspring. But the fall of man became a barrier between God and mankind. And what this, this broken fellowship uh, brought troubles abounding. And so many families struggle with these things. Problems abound. It's, it's crazy. Uh, the relationship with God was broken because why? Pride ruled in the heart. Uh, so I'm going to tell you something, a little thing that happened yesterday. My wife making squash casserole. And she says, uh, it, it was late, you know, it was getting late. She wanted to put it off for today. I said, no, no, no let's do it, let's do it. So, so I got the squash out, you know. And she says, uh, yeah, would you go down and get the uh, breadcrumbs? I said, sure. Where do you think they are? Oh, they're down there on the shelf. Okay, okay. So we got some shelves and cabinets and things where everything is. And so I go down there, and I'm down there for like six minutes. I'm looking and looking. I, that thing could be right in front of my face. I'm not going to see it. It's the way I am. And she, and she hollers, and I said, did you find it yet? I said, I can't find it. I said, was it in a bag or was it in like a cylindrical container? And, and she says, it's, it was in a bag. Okay, so I'm not looking at the bag. I look at this bag here. Uh, stuffing. Okay, look at this bag. Noodles. Okay, no, it's not that. Look over here. Something for the grandson. No, oh, that's not that. Okay. And I'm down there for another five minutes. She said, <laughs> and she says, can't you find it? I said, I, honestly, I can't find anything bread crumbs down here. I don't know where they are. And I'm opening up the cabin. I'm looking in. I don't want to, you know. I'm, okay, I got to get this going because she's tired and I'm tired. So I go upstairs. She goes down the stairs. She, I got him. <laughs> so I rush over to the door, and I meet her halfway at the stairs. I says, "Where'd you find him? Where'd you find him?" She says, "Right over here." I show him. You see that bag? That bag doesn't say breadcrumbs. That says stuffing. She says, well, don't you know they're made for breadcrumbs? No, I'm stupid. <laughs> oh, it was like the 4th of July, it was, and we weren't celebrating. <laughs> we were exploding. I'll tell you, I said, you let me out a wild goose chase. There was no breadcrumbs to be seen down there. And she, so, so we, we get ready for bed. You know, you can't let the sun go down upon your wrath. So. You're not supposed to anyway. So I go in there and I say, you led me on a wild goose chase, you know. And she got that little grin on her face. I, I said, I love you. I wish, wish we didn't have to go through that, <laughs> but we did. So the fellowship is reconcilable. And this, this was always something that bothered me with a lot of people who left Bethel Baptist Church was that they were unwilling to reconcile with another brother or sister in Christ. So the fellowship isn't all about dinner. The fellowship is just as when we're out there preaching the gospel or a meeting in here. It's still fellowship because the center of our fellowship is not you or me, it's Jesus. It's the Holy Bible. This is the closest thing we have to Jesus right now other than the Holy Spirit of God that indwells us. And so, yeah, we can, we can have arguments and we can get into disagreements, but always be able to reconcile those things and not having to just pick up your toys and leave. You know, we need fellowship as we see the day approaching. It says right here, forsake not the assembling. You know, if you have to, you know, pull up roots and move to another place, find a place of like-mindedness that you already are established in and let that be your choice of where you end up. Because without that, I tell you, you, you'd be surprised how little out there is based on the Bible. Amen. I, you, you really will. Okay. Thank God there are those places you can find them. Depending on what part of the country you go, there could be abundance of them. And, and, uh, and if everybody had the fellowship every other Sunday, you could never have to go buy groceries, right? <laughs> Just go there and take all the leftovers and eat all week long. <laughs> You could really work that out. Okay, so, 
All right, just to, just to bring this to a conclusion here, and I have to skip about five pages. In this life in which we live, there are deep valleys and, and there are long, hard times. Many of you are in the midst of those hard times. Many of you are going through the valleys right now and you're struggling with things. Uh, many have often wanted to quit, but they just can't quit. They don't, they don't want to quit. They know that if they quit, it's, it's a weakness that they're listening to the wrong voice. They're listening to the voice of Satan. It says, what's the sense of trying? Well, yeah, you can't do the things that God wants you to do, but you know, just, just let it go. Let him go. And, and just, just be at peace with yourself. Well, they kept on going, and they keep on coming, because they continued in fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And because of that, they could say, as the psalm said in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Amen. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. Amen. He leadeth me beside those still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me, thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runs over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now God tells us something important in this psalm. As his children, he tells us of his presence. He tells us of his protection. He tells us of his guidance and also his fellowship with us in all things. He is talking about the fellowship which comes by walking in the light of his word. And that's so important that we neglect that. God's word in our life because that's the thing that brings us together. None of you have seen Jesus Christ even if you have a picture of him in your hallway uh, which I don't know where you found that thing but especially if it's got velvet uh, on it, paint whatever, but the closest we have come to knowing our Savior is in this book. This book. King James. Father we give you thanks for loving us and being so we ask you, Father, to strengthen us in the days before us, Lord, because many, many more hard times are coming, many more valleys, until we reach that peak of the mountain when we hear our Savior say, come up hither, and <laughs> we're so forever to be with the Lord, we're to comfort ourselves with those words. What else can we comfort with ourselves, Father? What else can we comfort other than to be there for somebody? What else can we say? Uh, we look around us, and it's like being with Peter uh, walking out in the tempest. Seeing you, but then taking our sight off of you and getting caught up in the tumultuous ways of the world. So, Father, help us to comfort ourselves with these words and glorify you, Lord. And strengthen our fellowship in the days to have us. And let us not forsake the assembly, as you have said. In Jesus' name, bless our time in the back. May we enjoy our fellowship today in your precious name. All right, so it's going to take us a little bit of time to just get the grill going. And so you just relax and uh, come back when you're ready to come back. Again, if, you, if you're visiting, stay. If you didn't sign up, stay. Just stay. <laughs> stay and enjoy some fellowship, all right? Don't feel bad that you didn't bring anything. Maybe I'll preach about that next week. <laughs> Just kidding. All right, I love you. Sure, brother.